Hello and welcome to Sunday Thoughts from our Trend Desert Crate. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, apologies that we weren't uh, online last week. Yours truly here was sick and well and truly under the weather, uh, but I'm bouncing back, I'm glad to say. Now today is a really special day, Sunday the 22nd of November. Um, first of all, it's Russell's birthday. So a very happy birthday to our organist and desecrate to Russell. Uh, a little bird tells me it's one of our church wardens' birthday tomorrow. So happy birthday in advance uh, to Wesley McCracken. Hope you have a great big birthday uh, 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 tomorrow. And uh, all the best from all of us at our tray in Desert Crate. Today is also St. Cecilia's Day. And as some of you probably know, St. Cecilia is the patron saint of musicians. Also in our tradition in the Church of Ireland, uh, the Sunday before Advent, which happens to be today, is known in some circles as Stir Up Sunday. Uh, it takes that title from one of the collects in the Old Book of Common Prayer for today, uh, the Sunday before Advent, which begins with the words, Stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people. And the idea was that God will stir us and poke us and unsettle us and prod us. But in the minds of some of the less spiritual people who would go along to church on a Sunday morning, they would hear those words and think, heck, it's nearly Christmas. Got to get home, get stirring and bake the Christmas cake. Whatever you're doing today, have a great Sunday on Stir Up Sunday. We're here today in Listen House. Uh, many thanks to the good people of Listen for allowing us to film. Uh, and the reason we're here is that Listen House has connections with C.S. Lewis. Uh, the S in his name stood for Staples. He was Clive Staples Lewis. And of course, Listen House here, just outside Cookstown, was the family home of the Staples family. And C.S. Lewis used to holiday here when he was a child. We'll be going to Campbell College shortly in Belfast to show you where he went to school and to have a look at some more C.S. Lewis connections. The 22nd of November 1963 was a very historic day. It was the day in which JFK was assassinated. Meanwhile in England, Clive Staples Lewis passed away. Normally his death would have made the news, but of course it was overshadowed by the news from across the Atlantic. Apparently, C.S. Lewis never liked his name, Clive, so from childhood he simply asked people to call him Jack, though he wrote, of course, as C.S. Lewis. It's no understatement to say that C.S. Lewis was a very reluctant convert to the Christian faith. He, like many soldiers who fought in the First World War, um, experienced the horrors of the trenches and pretty much gave up on any faith he might have had as a child. But he was uniquely bright. He was a very gifted thinker and academic. He was a philosopher, a literary professor, and certainly in his young adulthood, he had little room for any faith in God. When he was 17, he wrote to a friend called Arthur Greaves, and he said, I believe in no religion. There's absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. Of course he was to change. 15 years later, he would write again to Arthur saying, Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call real things, namely the incarnation, the crucifixion and the resurrection. He wrote these words, he said, there are traps everywhere, Bibles laid open, millions of surprises. God is, if I may say it, very unscrupulous. Now another well-known author, J.R.R. Tolkien, and Jack Lewis and others used to meet in an Oxford pub called the Eagle and a Child. They would meet in a little room called the Rabbit Room. They formed a little society called the Inklings. And there they would drink and chat and discuss each other's work and writings. And those times together were very important in moving C.S. Lewis towards a conversion to Christianity. They would meet in the 1920s in Oxford and they would discuss ancient myths and legends. And they had a lifelong friendship which, uh, which was hugely important to all of them. Now, when he was just 30 years old, Jack Lewis took his first steps towards conversion. He was very cautious. In fact, his story reminds me of a nighttime meeting recorded in the Gospels between Jesus and a religious leader called Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, like C.S. Lewis, was a seeker after the truth. He was asking deep questions about what it meant to be part of the kingdom of God. 
what it meant to be born again. Jesus teaches Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound and you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. C.S. Lewis, as a young academic in Oxford, had equally big questions about eternal things. When he was 30 then, he became a theist. In other words, he developed a belief in a God in a very sort of a, a general sense. He described himself as a prodigal, kicking and stumbling, resentful, with eyes darting for a chance to escape. But two years later, he wrote to a friend. He'd been out for an after-dinner walk with Tolkien, and they chatted until three in the morning. And again he wrote to his old friend, Arthur Greaves, saying this. I have just passed on from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ and Christianity. My long night talk with Dyson and Tolkien had a great deal to do with it. Dragged into the kingdom of heaven, kicking and screaming, he described himself as the most reluctant convert in all of England. His story shows us that for the genuine searcher, for one who's looking for real truth, for answers to big questions, conversion is often a process rather than an instant thing. It can involve long conversations, reading, thinking, being content to, to live with lots of questions that for many of us will remain unanswered. A second thing I want to say very quickly about C.S. Lewis is that he was obviously a creative genius. He was a fan of poetry, music, myth and legend, and indeed all things beautiful. And he filled his mind with the lovely things as St. Paul encouraged us to do. When Paul wrote these words, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Think about these things. As well as popping into Listen House, we tore off to East Belfast, uh, where there are lots and lots of C.S. Lewis connections. We'll take you there in just a moment. But first of all, some music recorded right here in Desert Crate 32 years ago this month a lovely hymn based on what we call St. Patrick's Breastplate called This Day God Gives.
Every now and again, I have occasion to drop in to Campbell College in East Belfast. It's a particularly lovely campus at any time of year, but very much so in the autumn, with all the autumn colour. Now, there are several links to C.S. Lewis at Campbell College. Uh, the first you can see in the School Assembly Hall, if you look at the war memorials, remembering those who served and those who died in two wars who had links with the school. And his name is there on the war memorial because C.S. Lewis served in the First World War. In fact, he was there in the trenches at the Battle of the Somme and survived. He was only at Campbell for one term and then his family moved to England. He hated school life in England and often longed to be back at school in Belfast. Another connection with C.S. Lewis at Campbell College is a seemingly ordinary lamppost that you drive past on your way into the school. Many people reckon that this ordinary lamppost that Jack Lewis uh, walked past during his time at Campbell was the inspiration for a lamppost that would feature in his Narnia tales, a lamppost that marked the sort of edge of Narnia. Now, there are other C.S. Lewis links in East Belfast, and they're well worth checking out. Pop down to the Newton Arge Road, and you'll find the lovely East Side Visitors Centre at C.S. Lewis Square. There's a lovely wee cafe there called Jack's that will hopefully be open again fairly soon, and they do lovely coffees and lunches. Walk around the square and you'll find lovely statues from the Narnia Tales. You'll find there a very striking statue of Aslan the Lion, who in the stories represents Jesus. You'll find the White Witch with Turkish Delight. Whatever you do, don't take it. And you'll find my favourite, Mr Tumnus, hiding in the bushes. And then just around the corner, there's this beautiful statue made by Ross Wilson. The statue features a wardrobe a man and a chair and the man is about to open the wardrobe and go through the wardrobe. The man's name is Diggory Kirk but on the back of the wardrobe is a lion and the statue is called the searcher and that's exactly what C.S. Lewis was all his young adult life just like Nicodemus in our Bible reading a searcher after the truth perhaps like many of you. The words around the statue though on the ground are what I notice most of all. C.S. Jack Lewis, Ulster man. And then another inscription, writer, scholar, teacher, Christian. And these words I love, born 1898, reborn 1931. And that rebirth, that being born again, happened when the penny dropped for him as to who Jesus was and why Jesus died, and what it meant to trust him and follow him. Now, C.S. Lewis contributed so much, obviously, to the world of literature, but more than that, he contributed an awful lot to the world of Christian apologetics. In other words, giving good reasons as to why having faith makes good sense. He's a really important figure in modern church history. And that's why the Church of England encouraged parishes on the Sunday nearest the anniversary of his death the 22nd of November, to remember his work and witness as one of our saints, Saint Jack, C.S. Lewis. He was a reluctant but convinced convert. And even though he went back to his local church, he was not always completely at home there. He'd sit behind a pillar so the rector couldn't see the expressions on his face. He had little time for mod cons or gimmicks or trendy vicars. He wasn't totally comfortable in the world of the English parish church, but he knew that in order to be a genuine Christian, it was really important for him to be there. He couldn't go it alone. He wrote these words. When I first became a Christian about 14 years ago, I thought I could do it on my own, reading, retiring to my rooms and reading theology. And I wouldn't go to the churches or the gospel halls. I disliked very much their hymns, which I considered to be fifth rate poems set to sixth rate music. But as I went on, I saw the great merit of it. I came up against different people of quite different outlooks and different education. And gradually my conceit began just peeling off. He realized that being part of a church where there are different people with different views to your own was a really important part of Christian living. It keeps it real. 
Now at the start of this short talk, I said that C.S. Lewis died on the same day that JFK was assassinated. Just a few years ago, in 2013, a memorial stone was laid at Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey. The words on the stone are from the man himself. I believe in Christianity, as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. For C.S. Lewis, faith gave him a whole new way of looking and making sense of the universe around him, a lens, if you like, that helped him to focus on bigger things. Today, we give thanks to God for an Ulster man who was converted by the power of God, who thought through what it meant to be a follower of Christ, and then who used his creative talents not just to delight children with tales of witches and wardrobes and fantasy worlds, but also who gave the church so much wisdom and food for thought. I hope we all can learn something from his story. Mm -hmm.